Hello. I have the ple pleasure of having Richard Isaac, Isaac Miracles, a good friend of mine for about, uh, let's say, 10 years we know each other. Yeah. From the More, Montreal uh, Brestel Center. Uh, me and Richard have been friends. We, we, we often talk. We share a lot of ideas together. Uh, and I wanted to have him over, have him on, on the podcast today. Um, Richard's done, Richard is a music producer and music is very, Richard's very in tune with Rabbi Nath's teachings, him and his whole uh, kahila in uh, Montreal. Um, and we just want to have a conversation. I think everybody would get it. We had an amazing conversation the other day. I said, listen, Richard, we got to record it. This is a great conversation. So Richard, tell, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about your journey to Rabbi Nachman. It's a, it's a journey, huh? It's, I think everybody's journey to Rabbi Nachman is very, very unique. Yeah. And it's appropriate to call it a journey. It's really baderich, you know? Like Rabbi Nachman started his, that uh, famous lost princess, baderich sipachti. On the journey, I, I said a story. So my story at least from some sort of a beginning point, uh, I was introduced to Rabbi Nachman's teachings by a mentor, a friend. His name is Rabbi Liao Chaviv. He was a, a French rabbi that um, was kind of like a makeshift rabbi in a, a Sephardi Moroccan shul. And he would come once every three or four weeks. And uh, he gave the classes of Rabbi Nachman in French. And I, I, I remember this like yesterday. Uh, when he first said the word Rabbi Nachman, those two words, something happened to me. The way he said it, hmm. something happened, something entered in my heart and I, I became extremely curious as to who this rabbi was, why was his teachings speaking to me, and uh, it began my my journey into uh, what I call the Uber of Judaism. I think Rabbi Nachman is the Uber of Judaism. Beautiful, beautiful. I know we, we, we often, you know, we, we often speak about, I mean, you've done, you've gone into the self-help group, self-help world and, and the power of now. And we've, we've often discussed our similarities with that. And, yeah. um, and we always see, you know, Rabbi Nachman and, and all this, this new age, new age help, uh, Rabbi Nachman behind it. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit how you see the, the shift on how this new age, all this new age stuff, and how, how do you, how do you see it? Like I remember you you telling me about the power of now. Yeah. Can you give us a little a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, it's a big subject. <laughs> yeah. It's a big subject. So, I, I mean, I personally have always felt Rabbi Nachman's teachings are are so universal. They they have the ability to speak to anybody from any culture, any background, any religion. I have no problem speaking Rabbi Nachman with anybody. It's right, very, very right. unique to his teachings. Very, very unique. Even though he's clearly citing biblical passages and Talmud and Zohar, which are uh, uniquely Jewish, <laughs> um, you could tell that his teachings are universal. In fact, Rabbi Nachman quotes this. He says in Sichot Aran, he says, I don't look like the other tzaddikim where I dwell into the Torah and I take out a chidush, I take out a novelty, I found an idea. I get in touch with the universal concept. And then I struggle within the Torah to be able to find how I can make it fit. Now, I started coming through these ideas. I'm a very curious guy. I'm a searcher much like you, much I think like a lot of rest lovers out there. We're naturally searching souls. We're thirsty. When we see something that's attractive and that speaks to us, we pay attention. Right, okay. Right. Uh, the personal development world was a world that I, I definitely dabbled in. I went through. Um, and the more I got familiar with Rabbi Nachman's teachings, the more I started seeing similarities and also very clear distinctions, which started leading me on a path of trying to understand how certain pieces of Torah, I'm going to call it certain pieces of Torah, are kind of spread out in the world, sometimes even outside of the realm of classic Torah. And um, I started realizing that there's some sort of an integration, um, a beru or a targum that needs to be done. Okay, targum, which is, of course, classic from Onkelos. And the, the same way the Torah was translated, there seems to be a Torah out there that speaks to a number of individuals. Right. And there seems to be a Torah that is relevant 
uh, within the context of language being used, with the examples being used that speak to certain people. And to me and in my my journey, uh, this this fit very well because Rabbi Nachman is like a chameleon. He has the ability to dress up as he wishes and how he wishes to be able to get to a certain um, nikuda or a certain tachlit, a certain point, if you will, to deliver a message. There's a lot to say on that, but there, <laughs> that's a... Uh, that's kind of like how I, I started realizing that this Torah is universal. You could find it anywhere. I, I like that fact. He, he even said in his teachings that the whole world needs me, not just Jewish people, but the whole world, not just Jewish people, not even even big, big, big rabbis need me. He even said that even the bigger the rabbi, the, the more they need them because the more open-minded they are. Tell me, Richard, tell me, tell me your, your little, um, I know you had a little bit, in you were a little, you're in recovery right now, I understand, uh, for, for, tell me a little bit how Rabbi Nachman helped you. I know I was in recovery 20 something years ago for gambling. I know that you, you had a little stint in recovery. Tell me how, how Rabbi Nachman helped you get out of recovery, how he got you into, obviously into higher consciousness and how the down was really for the sake of the rise. Yeah. Wow. Big questions today, huh? We're uh, <laughs> we're jumping right in. <laughs> Think about how to really approach such a subject. It's obviously a very sensitive and a, yeah. a difficult yeah. thing to speak about. Um, in any spiritual type of progress, you encounter downers you encounter yiridot. Uh, some of those yiridot are easier to deal with. Uh, other types of yiridot bring you very, very low, very low. And um, I'm not ashamed today, and I think it's important to say it and to put it out there that I certainly experienced very low lows, you know, some really, really dark places. And almost trying to see how Rabbi Nachman's philosophy and his his teachings, how were they going to help me over there? Right. Because you, you were in his teachings and you and you got the love. I was, in, I was totally right. that's, immersed, that's, in, his, immersed right. in his teachings. It was also the mind bent for me. It was very difficult, um, especially when you encounter, um, you know, certain addictions and certain issues. And you're like, well, one second, I know this, but the way I'm acting and the way I'm living my life is not congruent. What's going on? And when you go to the experts in the field where they, you know, everything is in a box by them. No, no. If you have this problem, you need this medication. And if you have that problem, you need that. But don't think for one second that your little Rabbi Nachman jumping up and down and your little Torah lessons are going to um, get down to the level where they can also talk to your issue, into your into your problem, and that drove me nuts. Hmm. That that was an identity crisis for me. Um, I I fought it tooth and nail, and um, uh, you know, speaking of what we spoke about earlier about this this idea of universal teachings, this idea of translation, I started seeing that even within the material that I was being taught to deal with some of the issues that I was going through, certain traumas that I had from my parents' divorce, certain um, certain um, methodologies, modalities. I was just, you know, receiving them all. And I was being winked each time with different lessons, kind of like our conversations. Ooh, I mean, Nachman speaks about this here, but it's, it's all spread out. And so here you are, on one hand, you have a certain issue. You need to get help for it. On the other hand, it's some, there's like an internal I felt like an internal uh, mission to be like, but I wanted to come straight from uh, the, my spiritual source and started having to take it from here and take it from there. And um, I believe today, where I'm at today, thank God, um, that I was put there for a very specific purpose to be able to see Rabbi Nachman's light from that angle, oh, to be able to reconnect the dots and to be able to share um the the wins and to share the success of how to deal with such situations in life um 
in a language and in a context, I think that's relevant to a lot of people. So yes, today, um, thank God I am sober and I'm, I'm proud to say so. And I'm, I I'm humble enough to ask Hashem every single day to stay in that state. And uh, like Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld says so well, um, the state of addiction or the state of not being sober, it's not for a fringe group. I would say the majority uh, today of people um, have some sort of addiction, whether it's scrolling on your phone at night, right. okay, uh, whether it's overthinking at work, whether whether it's it's constant obsessive thinking, uh, whether it's I mean, there's endless examples of this. Think okay? except the, the present moment, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, the inability to be. I mean, I, I me and my friends we joke about this. We call it the Black Sunday syndrome. It's like, oh, my, like what you know, if, if you're married, and you have kids. And you experience Sunday in North America. It's like, well, what the heck are we going to do Sunday? If 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 it ain't planned out, right. it's like it's like you can you, get football, I guess. <laughs> you get frozen. You get frozen. You know, your wife wants to do this stuff like that. These are spiritual sicknesses that um, mm -hmm. the generation are, are facing, and the 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 way that people cope with them is they just want to numb it. They want to find a way to numb that pain. And um, anyways, that's what gets us, I guess, to start looking and searching for the right solutions. Let me ask you a question. Well, do you think, I, I believe, for example, I went through my own many, many, yeah. many, many levels of challenges personally. Um, yeah. Obviously, losing my son was one of them. But I, I believe that God gave me that that challenge when I could handle it. Do you believe that, you know, because we, we say, hey, how could I be connected to Rabbi Nachman's teachings all of a sudden? I'm, I'm, I got an addiction here, but you believe that you had to fall in order to, to, there's a spark that needed to be elevated. At least you had the tools in order to fix it. It's, it's reverse psychology because we could say, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, how can I fall? You were actually given the gift of, of elevating, you, I'm sure you've helped many, many people through that fall in recovery because you, you probably gave people in the 12 steps in a completely different language that they probably never heard. 100%. In fact, if you take a look at um, uh, the seven pillars of faith, when you take a look at that text that Rabbi Breiter put together, he synthesized Rabbi Nachman's teachings. It's it's revolutionary when you do a seven pillar chabura, and people are sharing much uh, in a in a twelve step um, context. It's revolution. I did it a number of times with close friends and other people that we just create like a safe place of people to share their ups and downs. The guy doesn't have to be addicted. It's just the, the sure. ups and downs of, of life. Uh, you, uh, you use a text like the seven pillars, which is concise enough and kind of points you to the truth. And then you calculate the gap between what you're experiencing, and what you're feeling. Okay. Vis-a-vis -vis the text. And you see the gap is enormous. And then you share that. It's extremely therapeutic. I think that is really the kavana. Of, of Rabbi Nachman Sichot Chabirim. Rabbi Nachman said, you should, you know, get together with a friend and pour out your heart. And they also said, you should do that with God. But he emphasized you should do it with a friend because that recognition, that hearing of yourself explaining the issue is already the rifua. Yes. So that's yeah. that's one, that's one ikuda. Um, I think I lost you, get, you explain that, explain the reflected light and the direct light. Like how you get that the reflected light. Why we need to do that? Like that, that's something where I think yeah. society today is afraid to talk yeah. about the issues. They have to talk about the issues. There's Look, when you when you go to a therapist and you explain uh, everything that you are experiencing, just that experience itself is extremely therapeutic. I mean, you're going to achieve that in hit bodidut. The thing with hit bodidut is you have to have a very strong emunan bitachon that Hashem is listening. Uh, and beautiful. when you don't have the recognition that a higher power is listening to you, so then you, you need something lower, which is another individual. That becomes your higher power, so to speak. Okay? So when you connect with another individual and you, you basically explain what you're going through and that person listens to you in a non-judgmental manner, just without any, you'll see, in, you know, I'm sure you know from the 12-step groups and stuff like that, uh, there's never anybody kind of talking back and saying, hey, you know what? Um, that's not the way you should look at it. No, that's not that's not the way they actually manage those 
those circles. They actually just let the person uh, share um, exactly where they're at, and that's enough. And what happens is when you start to hear multiple people share, you come to the conclusion, you're like, I think we're, we're basically fighting the exact same problem. We're using different language. The variables are different, but it's the same issues. There's no new issues under the sun. So th there's that. You asked me, I think, earlier. Beautiful like, concept, by the way, just to, to yeah. be able to, you know, so many of us, we're, we're not, you know, we, we, instead of trying to understand them, we're, we're judging. Yeah, you did this, like the constant, uh, the lack of space for other people. So you, you felt like the 12th step allowed us to give more space, which obviously... The, the, the 12th it, step, yeah. It, the 12th it, step, sure it made your marriage better and made everything else better when you had space. When you the 12th have, step, ironically, showed me the true kavana of what of what Sichot Chavrim was. And that, that, that ties back to what we're discussing. It's like, why did I have to see it from that light? Why, would I, why was I not able to understand when Rabbi Nachman said, Sichot Chavrim is this and this and this? Explain again, Sihot Chavirim. Explain again, Sihot Yeah, Sihot Chavirim is a term we use to say conversation between friends. Okay? Abin Nachman took this very seriously. In fact, one of, if I'm not mistaken. 34, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is lesson 34, but uh, one of uh, Rabbi Nachman's uh, students, I think it was Rabbi Starhart, or maybe one of the Talmidim, was so serious about uh, Sihot Chavirim and having conversations with friends and talking about real things that he he actually had a chavut of it. And I think it was on Yom Kippur, and he wasn't sure if he should meet his chavuta, and his chavuta showed up. Yom Kippur usually is a day where you know you're silent, you're not you're not getting into extraneous uh, conversation. No, this is kadosh, it's holy, and um, it needed to be you know kind of discussed. And so, to me, the beauty of this, coming back to your original question, like how did you get there? Why did you have to go through that? Do you believe that you were put there? Absolutely, because there was a spark. There's a spark of kedusha that's stuck over there, and that spark, ironically, sh uh, was shining from the twelve steps. But that spark today, if we're able now to take it out and then put it in its right place and context, well, then it elevates Rabbi Nachman's teachings, and that that is coming back to what we were discussing the other day when I was in Vermont and this idea of simcha and taking the malchut from the the kipot and. There's a lot to say on that. Explain to me why why we were speaking at that conversation we had was really great. Um, explain yeah, to me sure. a little bit why the importance of having of being happy. You know, obviously I've had a lot of classes on happiness, but I, again, I, I I always love your angle. Explain to me in your angle because everybody has a different a sure. different, different perspective. Explain your your angle why on, on lesson twenty four, which you spoke about a lot. And sure. the importance of doing joy with Simcha and why, and what practical advice you could give to people if they're not so. I, I, yeah, I, it, it's, it, it's just, th this is a number of different lessons that are still kind of building up, but I'll, I'll share with you what I'm living so, right now. Pra a pra practical level. Yeah, very practical way. Let me know if I get too uh, far off in my, my uh, the ideas, because you're right, it's got to stay practical. So, you know, when I got into Breslev, uh, I got really serious, like really serious. Like I wanted to be the best. The same way you get into something new, you want to get, right? So when you take something really serious, there's a gvura part of you. There's a discipline aspect of you that kind of builds. And I started seeing some of my teachers and some of my mentors having a very like lax, what I consider was a lax attitude. A, a very joking, I, I didn't understand it. In fact, I didn't understand for the first five, 10 years why uh, Breslov emphasized so much simcha. Like it's like, it's worse than eating pork if you don't, if you're not the simcha. Right. You know what I mean? Right. 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 It's like, you don't find in the Shulchan Aruch a halacha that says, you must do the mitzvot be simcha. It's an yeah. interesting point, by the way. Okay. You don't find that. Today, um, if you're not be simcha, it's like you're eating pork. Practically speaking, if you're not if you're not enjoying your Judaism and you're not having chayut and vitality from the mitzvot, you're you. It's obligated that you're going to be looking for chayut uh, outside of the Torah. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter, and this is where all the addictions come and all the the different ways of coping and and stuff like this. So, 
you know, I got into Lesson Torah 24 thanks to Rabbi Meir al uh, He came, I think, two years ago, he came to Montreal. And he's, you know, you know, Rabbi Meir, oh, my darling, jumping up and down. It's like, at some point, you're like, eh, it's a bit exaggerated. But then when you start to realize what we're facing, it's not exaggerated. It's absolutely required. We're in a generation where we, we do not know the value of the mitzvot. You don't know the value. Well, of the I know his personal story, what he was going through at that time. And I asked him, how are you functioning? Yeah. That, you that function? was the question. Yeah, how, how do you function? You have eight kids, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. How in the world are you functioning? Yeah. That was the questioning. Yeah. I didn't even, I said, how are you functioning? Forget yeah. producing the Torah. How in the yeah. world are you functioning? We both had that and, question. It was, it was like a ridiculous situation. And and um, when Rabbi Meir was staying at my house, seeing him function in his day to day and his his jokes, whether they were authentic or whether they pushed, put him in a state of positivity and put his mind in a state. And it's it was a it was a well thought out choice. He chose to do that. Okay, he applied Rabbi Nachman's teachings, and it cha- it transformed his life. And I saw this. Uh, very recently, maybe a couple months before Uman and coming into Uman and coming through the Chagim with this Nikuda and everything that was going on with Israel. And, and, and I realized that we have to bring the Simcha into the Torah. Mm-hmm. Now when Rabbi Nachman says, Mitzvah Gdola Liot B'Simcha Tamid, he's very, very, very serious about it. Because if you take a look at the Lost Princess, okay, I'm sure a lot of your your subscribers and people that listen to you are familiar with Rabbi Nachman's stories. Rabbi Nachman told... It's one thing I never went heavy, heavy duty in because uh, of my ADD. So we got to... <laughs> we got to go... Uh, we got to hit the lost princess. The lost princess... Rabbi Nachman, by the way, Rabbi Nachman said, I'm sure you know, that uh, there's only one book in Breslau that goes on top of the Likut Moran, which is Sipoy Masyot, which is the, the stories. Um, the, the stories for Rabbi Nachman was his way I believe, in my own words, um, was his way of tapping into the highest level of Torah, the highest, highest, using a medium that was unconventional. Okay, uh, Today, if Rabbi Nachman was alive, and he is alive, but if he was in a physical being, so to speak, he'd be making movies. He'd be, use, he'd be, he'd be, all, he'd be using every single media that has the ability to communicate to people immediately. And that's what a story does. Because when you tell a story, your defense mechanisms go down. You're not arguing with the story. You're sitting back. You're just listening. I mean, I told the students, I see that you guys are not changing with my lessons. I'm going to start telling stories. This is lesson 60, right? The Lost Princess. There is this king. He has six sons. He has a daughter. And on a certain day, he tells his daughter that... um, uh, and oh, by the way, he loved his daughter. He spent a lot of time with his daughter, almost that he kind of preferred his daughter over the six sons. And on a certain day, he told her, may the no good take you away. Right. And she left and uh, uh, he looked for her at night. He couldn't find her. And he looked for her in the morning, couldn't find her. And uh, then we're introduced to the Viceroy, the Shini HaMelech. And he comes and he appears and he basically sees that the king is sad. Bayamod says in the story, the, the language is very unique. He stands up and he sees that the melech, the king, is sad because uh, the princess is no, is no longer there. And he says, I need you to give me three things, a servant, the money, and a horse. And he's going to go look for her. And right away in the story, it says he finds her. He finds the lost princess. So that's a spoiler uh, alert. We find the lost princess. In, in other words, at the end of the day, you're going to win. Mm-hmm. You're going to find that lost princess, guaranteed. But now your whole life, and he explains in the story, and all the details of the story, is the process of finding her, the search, the journey, like we said in the beginning of our conversation. And for some reason, this year, I ponder that on that story so much because I asked myself, who is this Shini Amelech? Who is this Viceroy? He comes in out of nowhere. What's his connection to the lost princess? And how does he dedicate his whole entire life to looking for her? Who is it for him? Who is it for the, for the king? 
And I came to the understanding through a number of different lessons, uh, lesson 24, lesson 89, lesson 90, that simcha is the only way you're going to be able to tap in to an illogical strength to continue to find the lost princess. Um, you mentioned okay. something. You mentioned something before. You, I just you mentioned. Yeah. I want to emphasize. I want to emphasize what you said. The, the you said you have to bring the joy into the Torah, which is completely yes. the opposite of the. Yeah. We think that we go to the Torah, we get joy out of it. No. Yeah. The, 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 this is like a reverse psychology that that nobody understands. We well, have I to got this, in there I, with I got, the right attitude, right? I got this idea, frankly, when you look in the story and you continue the story. It yeah. says that he searched for her in deserts and forests. One day he takes a shvimin outside. He takes like a, a little pathway and he sees this huge castle with all these, um, these like soldiers around. And he's afraid to go into the castle. Okay. He's not sure because, uh, you know, they're soldiers. Anyways, he, he musters up his courage. He goes, he leaves actually, I think it's his, his horse. He leaves the horse behind. And uh, he goes in. Nobody says nothing to him. He sees a huge commotion, lots of singing, lots of, of food. He actually takes a piece of food. He sits down he, just to see what happens. And over there in the story, it says that he uses the word simcha. There's a lot of simcha over there, a lot of joy. All of a sudden, he sees a king. And the king makes a motion to bring the queen. Who's the queen? The lost princess. So he's looking all this. He's sitting back. And then the lost princess approaches him and she says do you know who i am do you recognize me she, and he says yes you're the lost princess how do i get you out of here she says you can't get me out of here this is the price of the lotov right when i started playing around with those ideas i recognized and i saw oh my gosh first of all the lost princess is in the lotov the lost princess is the shekhinah the lost princess is the vitality and the simcha that you're looking for in the mitzvah but guess what it ain't there. Yeah, right. Because the Shekhinah is in Galut. The, mm -hmm. the Shekhinah is the, the divine presence. Normally, I always thought to myself, if the Torah is so divine, I should read Bereshit Bara Elohim, and my heart should flame up. Because it's God's book. He wrote it. I, I should put on Tfilin if everything was normal, and Kesedeh, and things weren't switched by the exchange chambers, right? I should be able to do a mitzvah and feel a tremendous hitarbut to Hashem. Guess what? You don't. And you don't because everything is switched, because the Shekhinah is in the Loto. So I realized so that... Basically what he's saying, you, you just to clarify that. Yeah. The Shekhinah is in the Loto. That basically you're saying that the joy is in, 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 in the other nations. It's, it's in, in the joy is... It's, all, it's, it's in it's, the other nations. It's, it's the exact same idea that we've been talking about even with the... Music. The, the, you know, uh, well, the music, but Rabbi Nachman's teaching is kind of being spread out in different bodies Please. of wisdom. It's, this, right. it's the same exchange. In other words, there's a biru that needs to happen. There are sparks of, of Kiddushah that are stuck over there. Okay, right. This is an idea that came out of uh, Torah 89 and Torah 90. Right. But, and right. especially, specifically Torah 24, the Malchut fell into the Kripot. We know this. That means God's authority, God's divine Shechina, is in the Lotov. It turns out Torah 24 explains that when you do the mitzvot bisimcha, you elevate that spark until it, it's completely elevated and it leaves that realm, which is the same idea of the Ketorat when we recite the, the, the Korbanot. And so I, I reckon, and Rabbi Nachman's chidush of Torah 24 is that when you do the mitzvot besimcha, you achieve the exact same thing. So then I started realizing, I need to make sure that I'm always in a state of simcha, independent of what's happening around me. That means if it ain't working well for me at work, okay, um, it doesn't make a difference. Because I have mincha in half an hour, and I better make sure that the state that I go into mincha is not me worrying about the client not signing or the fire that I have to put out over here. Because if I go into mincha with worrying about work in this, I cannot pray mincha besimcha. And if I cannot pray mincha besimcha, okay, I'm not elevating anything in the mincha. I'm not getting the chayut that mincha has to offer me. Okay? So now my korban, my sacrifice, is to put myself in a state of simcha. 
and coming back to Rabbi Meir, what that means is there are very practical things that you can do to get an estate of Simcha. And, and once you understand that, your Judaism transforms. You become a Sheni Amelech. You start looking for the Bat Malka. You're no longer an employee. You're a viceroy. You're a, you're a, you have a deep, deep mission in your Judaism. It's, it's, it's really a paradigm shift in terms of how you look at the Torah and what you have to do and versus what you're privileged to do. It's funny how you say sometimes I have to go work out right before I pray Mincha. Because I can't pray, I, otherwise I just can't do it. It's just I, a, I have I have a friend, a good friend of mine, David. So I, and I have and the prayer and the energy and the prayer is like night, night and day, just from a yeah. From a, from I, a, and a hundred percent. I have a good friend that that asked Rabbi Nathan Maimon. You know, he was super into the gym, really, really, uh, and it, you know, he 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 couldn't find his simcha in his avodat Hashem. Rabbi Nathan Maimon said, "Listen, in the morning, I'll work out first, then we'll pray." Go get the simcha from there because it's stuck there for some reason. Okay, it could be that if the, if he does that for a certain amount of time and he and he removes the simcha from there, it could be that at some point this this avodah disappears. Okay, but there is an exchange here. Everything is is like switched. So when Rabbi Nachman says mitzvah gedola liyom simcha tamid, he's very serious about it. If you got to make jokes and be a, a joker and do mila dishtuta, which he says that the rov olam needs to do mila dishtuta, which is you need to be, you need to make jokes. You, you need to be happy. If you're not doing that avodah, it's for sure you're doing the Torah in a very dry way. You're not going to get chayit from the Torah. He even said that first be happy, then be religious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said it black and white. First yeah. be happy. Because the whole point is if you're religious, you're not happy. The whole it's like yeah, like a nun walking around, you know. Yeah. And, and like we all did chuva thinking, we all did chuva thinking. Like um, if I if I do God's will, I'll automatically be happy. So it's like I'm I, I'm here to suck, I'm here to suck the Torah out of happiness. You know what I mean? I want to use the I want to consume the Torah to make me feel happy. No, that ain't gonna work. Wow, it's not it's 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 not gonna work that psychology. way. Psychology, reverse psychology. You're gonna have to be besimcha. And when you're in a simcha state, then when you do the Torah, it's ola machirut. It's a different, uh, it's a different hargasha. Can can we apply this to marriage? Can we apply this to business? I mean, what's the difference between hard work and stress? For example, hard work, if you enjoy it, it's called passion. Yeah. Hard work, I think Simon Sinek said it. Hard work, hard work, if you hate it, it's called stress. Um, you know, marriage, hard work. If you go in there with 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 intention to give. With joy, it's a whole different marriage. It's the, the attitude. It's a great, but think about it before, not afterwards, which is amazing. Agreed. Agreed. Your wife is the lost princess. Wow. <laughs> your wife, you're responsible for your wife's happiness. That's wow. clear. That's, a tough, that's a tough line. That's a tough line to say today. And, well, it's 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 it works kabbalistically all the way through. And uh, if your wife is not happy, it's a reflection of you. You're not bisimcha. You may think you're bisimcha. Right. But you're not truly, really. Be if you were truly besimcha, then it would shine right through her. You know what I mean? If she, if you see her that she's stuck in all different types of things that are giving her chayut, and you disagree with them, somewhere along the lines, you're responsible for that, and right. you need to find ways to give her enough chayut so that she has she has simcha. One of, the complaint, one of the complaints that people have, and, and again, it, it, it's. That why they're disconnected. It's just the over. We, it feels like the schedule is very heavy. Like it's just heavy. You know, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do that. Unreasonable demands. But if we understood that, they, that at the end of the day, it's because we're not getting joy. We're not getting joy in what we're doing. We're not getting the vitality when we're doing it. It makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's look. It's it's like uh, you know who says this also to Tony Robbins. He he, he says you you take a guy. You know. Um, start working out oh, well I, you know i gotta go to the gym i gotta grab uh, the bag and then i gotta i gotta change and then it takes this time the guy doesn't see the big picture he doesn't he doesn't understand he's not connected to the tahlit of what he's doing right? right so then i break down every single task becomes very very heavy i don't have chayut. but if i take my vitality from the end goal then give me a million tasks it doesn't make a difference it's not it's not it's not, it's not, it's not me, it's not, it's not, it's not blocking me from wanting to advance because I'm connected to the end goal. I'm connected to the tachrit. That's where I'm pulling the chayut. Because it's funny how you say that, because it's, even in his bodhidut, 
you know, where sometimes, you know, we, we, we do a lot, we talk a lot about it, bodidut, which means talking to God. But people are, are, you know, one of the things that I remember from my own, for when I started, obviously, in my rookie days, I was so busy um, watching the scoreboard. Okay, what's happening? I prayed. What's happening? Like, yeah, there, was yeah. no, there was no room for, for, there was no room for the shechina. There was no room for creation because I was so stuck on forcing. I need this. I need that. I need yeah. this. Until I pulled back and went in there just to try to connect, not get. Yeah. My, whole, my whole prayer just completely took, took off. Uh, but when I went there, it was frustrating, you know, like a like a frustrating little child that's not getting answered and forcing things. There was no space. So like you said, we have to create that space so our creator can it's, talk about us. It's an interesting. I mean, there's so many different, what you do, you know, seclusion and meditation with your higher power, there are so many facets and so many flavors and so many um different experiences a person can have within them but what you're describing this this kind of like keeping score is uh, is what i call you know serving hashem as the employee you know I, I, i'm okay to do your commandments you know as long as you hook me up right like i'm gonna stay skinny i'll make money uh, things will go good for me as long as we have those those elements i'm willing to do what you want me to do but when you look at the Shania Melech in the story of the lost princess, it's completely the reverse. Why is it the reverse? Because he's out on a mission. He's out on a mission to find the lost princess. The lost princess also is Shayach to him. It's Shayach to the king because it's one and the same. For example, in Lesson 89, I mentioned to you, we had this, this conversation. 89 and 90 are very similar. Very similar, very but similar. two different angles. Two, two different, different angles. angles. Correct. One from the Shvirat Akelim and one from the, the Chesvonot. Rabbi Nachman says in Torah 89 that everything that a person is lacking materially, uh, spiritually, okay, is the the exact same lack is coming from the Shekhinah. What does that mean? So you're telling me that what, uh, the problems that I'm going through is the exact same problem that the Shekhinah has? That's a bit heavy. And Rabbi Nachman addresses that. He says, Kshadam Bo'ed. When, when you so, recognize that the problem is on top and on the bottom, you're going to get depressed. What, what kind of messed up situation is this? And he then explains that when you realize that the king gave you a tremendous kavod and shared his pain with you, when he shared his pain with you, it's a tremendous honor that you have to really contemplate because then it, it changes your perspective. It gives you new mochin. He calls it, then you're going to have simcha. How could you have simcha if the, the king is sharing pain? with? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense, but it's a huge, huge hasaga. It basically means that you have to transcend your personal pain. You have to understand that the issues and the problems that you have are not because you're a bad guy. It's a collective pain that's shared with the whole entire nation, like what Israel is going through right now. There's not one Jew in the world right now, religious or not religious, that doesn't feel some sort of a frustration or a, a lachat and an anxiety of what's happening over there. That's called the collective pain that's shared. That collective pain is the Shekhinah, and we're only getting a fraction of it. And when you understand that Hashem is giving you that pain because He wants you to transcend it and then do something about it, you become uh, the viceroy. You become somebody that's starting to work instead of somebody who wants to get, and therefore your conversation changes in Ibn Right. So your main emphasis is right, for his sake. That's what we always, you know, we never understood why we always pray for his sake, for his sake, for his sake. Yeah, for the, for the sake of the Shekhinah. Rabbi Nachman says, oh, get up in the middle of the night, tikkun chasot, like you speak about so often, okay? Get up in the middle of the night, I'm going to break my sleep? For what? So you have one guy says, okay, I'll break my sleeve to get to fix my personal problems. Okay. Well, what if I told you that your personal problems are God's problems and they're one and the same? Are you going to, are you going to look for the lost princess now? So, so now waking up in the middle of the night takes a whole other angle because my motivation, yeah, I got to fix some certain issues, but this is a global issue here. And it's, it's a very empowering mission in, in my opinion supported that i got out of that it's like when you have when you are 
the reason why your temple is destroyed in the first place is because your consciousness is off. You, you're not thinking straight. Right. So you build your own building, you help somebody else build another building. But when your building is down, all you want to do is tear everybody else's buildings down or or, yeah. or, or ask, how come that guy has a building and I don't? That's the worst of it. Because now, not only do you feel the, the God's pain, but you're you're justifying that the world is unfair and, and, and God doesn't know what he's doing. So it could to bring a person to anger and rage and and and, and that's, yeah. that's not chinam is what we're yes doing. yeah the, the bet amikdash is your temple and this this nikuda this point that we're just speaking about this healed me a lot from the personal shame and personal heaviness of having an issue and 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 having to deal with it and understanding that it had a much much higher purpose than just than just my personal issue wow. and and once I understood that. I'm like, oh, it's it's wow. it, it's 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 a paradigm shift, you know. You take a person who has an addiction, you take a person that's struggling in a certain issue, and you let him know. By the way, you're not the only one that, that has this, okay? And guess what? God's letting you feel a bit of a bit of his pain. And then he says, "Well, why is God in pain? Why is God in pain? You know why God is in pain? Boom! Another door opens. Oh, and I can do something about that. Yeah, you can do something about that. Well, what? I mean, Nachman puts up the etzot. Oh, and by the way, you're going to need massive amount of sikha to go to to do this avodah. To look for the lost princess, you need so much. You need a simcha that uh, uh, my, my rabbi, uh, Rav Avraham Mifcha, French Breslov rabbi, he uh, with Rabbi Sanson, they came out with this little book called Mishulef Chaylef. I don't know if you saw it. It basically means simcha yitera, which is coming from the seven beggars, one of the stories of Rabbi Nachman. You need a joy today in Avodat Hashem that is so illogical, okay, that it defies anything you can think about. One of the students of Rabbi Nachman used to dance for hours a day. He says, if, if you're not dancing every single day, you cannot have that simcha. You spoke about the five practical ways sure. to get your simcha, right? We said the first one was to do mila dishtuta, which is to be a joker, to be, to, 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 to do funny things just to get in a state of, of joy. The second one we said was to move your body, which is dancing, which we can put in music. You could put working out over there. Anything that will, will move your body. The third one we said was Azamra, taking an inventory. The fourth one was Ki'ilu, fake it till you make it. That, that joy is a choice, whether I'm feeling it, whether I'm not. A little bit like if you're serious about the gym, whether you feel like training or not, you're going to show up. And the fifth is what we're doing today, which is speaking about joy. And those five practical etzot is what you need to find the Bat Malka, because you're going to go through tons of yeridot. Yeah. Tons of yeridot. It's funny, there's a, there's a Gemara that says, whoever, in lesson five, also in the second half, whoever puts Hashem as a partner in distress gets double. Mm. So it's like, not only is it, was it an opportunity for you to... Um, to recognize that you're not a victim to this addiction, but you came right. out of it with a double consciousness. Yes. It's very so it, well. It, it, it very was not well just, um, you know, because 98% or 99% of people with an addiction will, will basically forget the double. They'll, they'll lose their self-esteem. Not And not only that, even if the ones that have recovered walk around with a heavy thing that says I'm an addict for the rest of my life, there's no way to get out of this. And I, I fundamentally disagree with that. It is and true. I, yeah, I, I, and not, not in a, in a, in a like, huh, I think this way is better. No, it's just that that was one of the biggest sticking points that made me realize we spoke about this Beru, kind of like filtering out. And, um, we don't need to be walking around with labels. I'm, I'm, I'm a soul. I'm a Jewish neshama. That's what I am. That's, that's, that's who I am. You know what I mean? And this is the body that God gave me. You know what I mean? But the whole but, point on a conscious level in recovery, I mean, reading David Hawkins' book, he says it very well. He, he and he really bring, he really helped me understand consciousness. That really they when you come out of, out of the, after you do the five steps, after the, tw the the twelve steps, you come to a higher level in consciousness that you would have ever gotten if you didn't go before the addiction. That makes sense. So you come out of there. Not I'm an addict. I'm a, I'm a, I got high higher consciousness. So what are you talking? You're not a. You're you're in a higher consciousness. You're you're yeah. living a life of love. You're living a life of trust. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Normally, yeah. 
Yeah. If we did heat bodhidhu uh, properly, we would get to the exact same level of consciousness. Right. It, it, if 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 we had heat bodhidhu properly with the right mukhin that we're speaking about, um, it's that it's it's all there. I mean, Ahmad says in Torah thirty four, you we need three things: connection to the tzaddik, sichot chaverim, and heat bodhidhu. The connection of those three repairs the broken heart. What's what's addiction? Right. Exactly. Exactly. What, what's a, it, it's amazing how even though Breslov has gotten it, it's it's you know it's spreading. Obviously, there's I'm teaching it. There's a lot of people teaching it. Rabbi Rush, whoever's teaching it, God willing, yeah. you're going to be teaching it uh, in, a, in, a, in a higher. I've always pushed you. We're sharing. We're sharing. The the, the, the the biggest light that came to me was pe- people shared yeah. their light with me, and yeah. the biggest gift that I I would love to give is simply to share. To share, but to teach, like uh, we know something, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wear that hat. I love how you got that out of the twelve steps. The sharing is is enough. Yeah, it's enough. That's it's, that's the that that's the sichot that that is the sicha chaverim. A guy tells you, you know, uh, I'm having a a problem with my wife. She told me this, that, that. Shut up. That's it. It's enough. I mean, even the gemara, don't. even the gemara tells us that a person should have a worry. Should he should talk to somebody about it? Yeah, to get it this out. Is, yeah, this is something. This is, I guess, this is this is another thing. The social media that did it's instead of making people connected, they disconnect because they now they're alone with their problems on social media, watching everybody else have a great life. And on and, and a, a practical level, whoever's listening to this, you should d- discuss classes, discuss good ideas with your friends, or talk to each other about your problems. It's extremely important that you you'll get this reflected light. It's so important. You guys in Montreal, what you guys have in Montreal in the Breslov Center, I mean. You guys have something very, very special. It's, it's yeah, it is. It's, it's again, it is. It is a mini heaven in, in Montreal. There's no it's, doubt. Uh, you guys have something. Yeah. In, uh, I mean, in, I don't have that in Miami. I I, I I don't think I've seen that. What you guys have anywhere in the world. I'm going to be honest with you. The group of guys that you have, and the and the energy you guys have, and the and the, and the collective consciousness, and the no fill. It, it's an incredible. I have maybe you have to go to Montreal. Maybe the price. That's the price for the weather. That's like right. You guys have, <laughs> Maybe that, <laughs> you there's guys a spark that's stuck that. yeah. there. That's for sure. Yeah, I hear you. It's I. I, I tried I to do that in Miami, but it, it just wasn't. It wasn't. Um, you know. Look, it's 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 interesting. I I grew. Uh, I was born in Montreal, but I I lived in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, till about ten eleven. Uh, normally, my destiny, I would have been. I would have been a Jew in the states. I probably would have been assimilated. I would have really, sure. you know, speaking about trauma, I think we're talking about my parents divorced around 10, 11. My mom came, took me and my sister back to Montreal. Um, we lived about 20 minutes away from the Montreal Aggressive Center in a place called uh, DDO. And, uh, and lo and behold, God had it all planned out. Okay. Right. So it's like, it's like, you know, massive trauma, parents divorce. Uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with that. I'm going to share this collective pain with you. Um, but I'm going to bring you to a place where you're going to connect a couple of sparks. And it's it's going to be the healing for you and the healing for others. And um, it's I, I'm super, super grateful that I have the Montreal Wrestle Center. It's it's one of the biggest things in my life. I never understood what Rabbi Nachman says. I like well-baked Jews. You know, he says I like people that are well-baked. And, and, and it's funny, everybody who's really connected to Rabbi Nachman, everybody's got some brokenness in their life. Something's, sure. something's broken and then that gets fixed. Another thing breaks. It's like this constant, constant yearning. And, and But that's it. That's the, that's the only way. At least we're staying sane in an insane world. Yeah. I, I uh, yeah. These days, I, I, these days, as soon as I feel any type of heaviness or worry, or a sadness. Oh. I'm gonna just dance by myself until it goes away. Wow. If that doesn't work, if that doesn't work, and, and try try dancing by yourself until your state changes. Okay, it's gonna you're gonna feel like an idiot for the first minute or two. You know, dancing more by yourself five minutes, ten minutes. At some point, you're like, hmm, I do this on the treadmill. You know, when 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 I want to work out and and I want to lose weight, I have no problem running on the treadmill for thirty minutes. Right, right. If I want to dance to get happy, am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. Dance. I, I think Richard. I think that I think feeling like an idiot would be taping ourselves when we worry at work. 
and thinking yes. that we're in control of something. I think that's a bigger idiot. Thinking that the person's actually in control of everything that's happening in his life. Um, we're falling for this illusion that, that's every not, day. That's normal. That's normal. And then feels like an idiot. Complete opposite. This this is why, you know, I was speaking, um, even Rabbi Meir al Kabas was talking about this. I was speaking to my friends about everything that's going on in Israel. I, I see my friends, the ones that are glued to the news, okay? The ones that are watching every single video and sharing nonstop. They have no chayut. They lost all their chayut. And they, 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 and they, the kavana is good. They want to be involved, but it's a complete trick and an illusion to do one thing. Take the simcha away. How are you going to pray tomorrow morning when you have all those images and you cannot? It's impossible. Yeah. That should help us. But again, Richard, it was so nice having you. What any any can can you share your songs with you? I think you have a um you can look for YouTube? Isaac Miracles. My Isaac my Miracles. songs Isaac Miracles on YouTube, uh I iTunes, Spotify. My yeah. songs are really a result of um the a lot of the songs are are coming from Torah that I studied in Rabbi Nachman that I shared with friends, and friends shared with me and just kind of expressed in, in the song format. Wow. But yeah. Hashem should, uh, bless, Hashem should bless Amen. you. Amen. I, I, I think you should uh you should you should go very heavy in the French community. <laughs> yeah. I think I've always told you you gotta do the same thing in the French community that I try to do here. Amen. Hashem. Thank you for your great work. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. You too. Bye.